thank you for the invitation to the International Association of Tamil Journalists for this invitation to speak at your conference today. Um, it's going to be a difficult act to follow uh, the speakers before me, uh, particularly with uh, the very organized and, uh, and carefully articulated speech of Mr. Dissanayam. Uh, but there are three things that I thought I will focus on today. The first is uh, to reintroduce the significance of having to discuss about the Prevention of Terrorism Act and the Sixth Amendment in the context of uh, the issue of press freedom in Sri Lanka, uh, particularly as it relates to the Tamil National Question. <coughs> the second is on the problem of what I have in the past called de tamilization of the uh, problem uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, de -tam uh, de uh, Tamilization of the Tamil national question as being the center of the democratic uh, problem in Sri Lanka and how that relates to the question of press freedom in Sri Lanka. And finally, on the state of Tamil journalism itself in post-war Sri Lanka and some critical observations as to its conduct in the post-war realities that Tamil see in Sri Lanka. Let me begin with the first uh, point on the PT and the Sixth Amendment. Uh, this is an obvious point, the impact of the Prevention of Terrorism Act and the Sixth Amendment on the um, uh, on press freedom in Sri Lanka, but something that is uh, that has to be reminded again and again, particularly the Sixth Amendment, which I think uh, sometimes uh, for, falls, uh, uh, is, 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 is not mentioned in, in, uh, in um, debates around media freedom in Sri Lanka. Now, why do I say this? Uh, let me quote from uh, the permanent representative of Sri Lanka to the UN just a couple of days back, uh, Mr. Ravinath Arya Singh uh, at, uh, addressing, responding to questions from the human, UN Human Rights Committee as part of the International Covenant on Civil and Political, uh, Political Rights uh, uh, periodic review where he stated, and this is para 37 of his speech, he says, and I quote, further some statesmen, uh, statements made by political leaders as well as other prominent members of society in the North can be construed to incite violence and a possible resurgence of terrorism. As a use of terrorism to secure political and ideological objectives, including a separate state, remains a possibility, the time is not right as yet to repeal the PT." Unquote. Now, this reminds us of uh, why the PTA, uh, according to the Sri Lankan government, remains in the statute books of Sri Lanka, but also as to why it was introduced in the first place. The PTA was primarily introduced as an instrument to suppress the Tamil uh, movement uh, towards self-determination. And I, I am keen to stress that this was not only the armed uh, wing of the Tamil self-determination movement that uh, the PTA was aimed at suppressing. And in the post-war context, definitely, uh, it, it is used uh, to, to even suppress expressions of self-determination that also fall short of, uh, of uh, uh, secession. Uh, that is something that we uh, need to uh, remember. Now, there are uh, recent reminders. Now, Thysanayam's case itself is a reminder. Uh, now, in Thysanayam's case, which is quite uh, well known and I don't want to spend a lot of time, it is important to look at the indictment itself. Uh, what exactly did they find problematic in Thysanayam's case? And um, Section 21H of the Prevention of Terrorism Act was invoked, something that is again and again invoked even in the post-war context. But this was in the context of the war uh, taking place in the East. And Section 21H uh, deals with uh, statements that might contribute to racial or communal disharmony uh, being prohibited by the Prevention of Terrorism Act. Now, what did this an item actually write uh, to, to come under the purview of this section? And well, let me read uh, what, what, uh, what the annexure to the indictment actually had to say uh, with regard to uh, what they found problematic with this an item's writing. In July 2006, in an editorial that he wrote uh, for the Northeastern Monthly Magazine, uh, under the heading, Providing Security to Tamils Now Will Define Northeastern Politics of the Future, unquote, the problematic statement in that editorial that they made, uh, it was two uh, uh, different articles that they made the subject of his indictment, one of which, and I'll quote this particular statement that they found problematic, it is fairly obvious that the government is not going to offer them any protection, them meaning Tamils here. In fact, it is state security forces 
that are the main perpetrator uh, of the killings, unquote. This was one of the uh, lines in an editorial that he wrote in July 2006 in the context of the war on the East that was made the subject of his indictment uh, in, the, uh, in the High Court uh, of Colombo. Now, the second uh, one is even more, uh, is even more um, uh, uh, brazen and obvious in terms of what the Sri Lankan government's intention with the PTA is. And this is a November 2006 Northeastern Monthly article that he wrote. And, and in that, the particular uh, sentence that they included in the indictment as, as contributing to, by the way, racial and communal disharmony. This is the subject of Section 21H of the Prevention of Terrorism Act. And I quote, such offensives against the civilians are accompanied by attempts to starve the population by refusing them food as well as medicines and fuel with the hope of driving out the people of Vahara and depopulating it. As this story is being written, Vahara is being subject to intense shelling and aerial bombardment, unquote. Now, we know that uh, this was again reenacted in the north uh, when the battle uh, uh, focused on Vanni, where again similar tactics of, of denying uh, uh, food uh, and water uh, to the people was used as a war tactic uh, by the Sri Lankan government, something that is even acknowledged in the UN panel of experts report. Now, the point that I am getting to is that expressions of this was considered by the Sri Lankan government uh, in that indictment as contributing to racial and communal disharmony. And, 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 the, and you know what the verdict was. The verdict was 20 years in prison for Tisanayakam. Now, it is, it is this kind of regulation. And Tisanayakam's case, to me, uh, was, not, uh, was not something that was personally designed against him. It was a signature case for the Sri Lankan government to warn particularly, I believe, Tamil journalists not to speak the truth in terms of what was happening in the war. It was an attempt early on, as you know, th this was even before the war moved to the north where things got much more serious. It was a warning to journalists, uh, to Tamil journalists, not to report on the war, and if they do report on the war, that this consequence would follow. And that, that, uh, and, and that is a remind, uh, and that is a message that, that the Sri Lankan governments keep uh, reminding uh, journalists of, even in the post-war context, to talk of violations against uh, the perpetrated by, by successive gov governments against the Tamil people is something that should not be reported. Now, let me bring in now the Sixth Amendment. The Sixth Amendment, as you know, makes even peaceful advocacy of secession as constitutionally barred and criminalized. To, to me, uh, the Sixth Amendment is significant because the Constitution generally does not uh, provide for criminalization. It is not a criminal code, it's not a penal code that deals with matters relating to crime. But the only possible crime in the Constitution, the, the, the crime that has been given constitutional status, so to speak, uh, in Sri Lanka is a crime of peaceful advocacy of secession. Now, it is not only secession. If you actually look at the oath that public officers, including members of parliament, have to take, they have to they have to allege uh, their, their, their loyalty to the constitution of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, which means that to speak against the unitary character of the state, which is an entrenched provision of the Sri Lankan constitution, can also be interpreted as falling under the purview of the Sixth Amendment. Now, we know that this has been the case. There have been cases filed even recently against the Tamil National Alliance, against their manifesto uh, in the Northern Provincial Council election, which have been claimed uh, as, as violating uh, the Sixth Amendment and where the Tamil National Alliance have been forced. I don't know whether the Tamil National Alliance itself would be happy to describe it as being coercive, but where the Tamil National Alliance had to uh, submit affidavits before the court saying that they don't uh, stand for uh, a secession of Sri Lanka and that they stand for a federal uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, but the point that I'm uh, uh, trying to make is that the Sixth Amendment uh, has been sort of forgotten off the radar. Sivaram, I remember uh, uh, reading from Tamil Nation, that wonderful website that Nadeshan Satendra used to curate, in a speech in 1999, uh, used to say that, uh, said, said at a conference in, 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 in Toronto, uh, uh, noted that the, the fact that the Sixth Amendment has remained as part <coughs> of, of the books of Sri Lanka, of the Constitution of Sri Lanka for so long, is that people have internalized, journalists have internalized the fact that this is something that has to be accepted and not even questioned. I mean, learning to live with that kind of freedom of expression, with that kind of narrow uh, uh, prism of what we mean by freedom of expression. Sivaram also mentions in that speech a committee that was appointed by President Chandrika Bandar Nayaka Kumar in 1995 to look at uh, restrictions on press freedom. 
uh, which had, uh, um, among others, uh, people like Dr. Shirali Bandar Nayakar, then a, a Supreme Court judge, later Supreme Court uh, the Chief Justice, uh, Dr. R. K. W. Gunasekhar, uh, uh, a famous uh, constitutional law in Sri Lanka, once president of the Sri Lanka Law College, um, uh, and, and Dr. Jayampati Vikramaratna, President's Counsel, again an eminent uh, constitutional lawyer and human rights lawyer who has advised many governments in the past on, on devolution issues, all of them recommended uh, that the Sixth Amendment has to be taken off the books and that in a future constitution the Sixth Amendment should not figure. Sivaram, however, points that there was one significant dissent. There was one significant dissent in that committee that recommended the Sixth Amendment be abolished uh, to ensure press freedom, and that was Mr. Victor Gunavardhana. Mr. Victor Gunavardhana, who was the only, I think, media personality in that committee who, who dissented from that particular uh, issue and said uh, that the Sixth Amendment, there is no uh, connection between Sixth Amendment and media freedom. Sivaram uh, makes that point to show how. Uh, the English media uh, that, that uh, Victor Gunavardhana belonged to and, and largely the singular sort of media class did not find Sixth Amendment a problem and was largely oblivious to the Tamil question and the effect that the Sixth Amendment has to the Tamil question and to Tamil uh, uh, media activity in, in, in particular. So I, I, I think it's, it's very important to remind us because I have found this uh, to, be, to be problematic uh, from, from again personal experience just spans only a week. Last week in Geneva, the Tamil Civil Society Forum that I represent uh, sometimes, um, uh, we made a submission to the Human Rights Committee quite early on to include in their list of issues Article 1 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which looks at the right to self-determination, and to ask the Sri Lankan state as to how they are giving, uh, <coughs> what political processes and constitutional processes they have put in place to give effect to that right. Something that the Human Rights Committee itself in General Comment 12, which they published in 1990, said was a requirement that the state report on these constitutional processes that provide for right to self determination. Now, in the past two occasions, and I haven't looked at other occasions, but definitely in the past two occasions, the Human Rights Committee itself has shown reluctance. The UN Human Rights Committee, which is made up of international law experts, largely academics uh, who sit in Western universities, but also outside of Western universities, have failed to raise Article 1 as an issue that affects <coughs> Sri Lanka. Uh, furthermore, uh, for, 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 furthermore, even uh, the, the problem with the Human Rights Committee not taking up Article 1 as an issue we pointed out was that Article 1 cannot be the subject of uh, individual communication complaints uh, in the ICCPR process, something that Sri Lanka has anyway ignored, uh, has said uh, uh, doesn't belong uh, to the Constitution. This was uh, Chief Justice Saratan Silva's judgment in uh, Singara Services Attorney General some seven years back, but uh, the, the fact that the Human Rights Committee itself, given that the state review process is the only avenue to examine Article 1 related rights uh, being implemented within Sri Lanka, has failed successively to take, a, take up that issue, tells you how much uh, that the human rights community, uh, and, and, and this, uh, this is something, this is a reflection that I make even of uh, the larger sort of human rights processes that Tamils have been involved in, um, there has been a failure to look at uh, the real issue in Sri Lanka <coughs> being about the right to self-determination of the Tamil people and, and even other peoples uh, uh, depending on whether those communities have saw, thought it fit to articulate their grievances uh, around this particular article. Uh, so, uh, and, and we actually pointed out in our submissions that Article uh, 157 of the Constitution based on the Sixth Amendment is a real, it is not only uh, an impediment uh, on peaceful advocacy <coughs> of secession, which we, and we've shown examples of how it is also an impediment on peaceful uh, expressions of Tamil self-determination short of secession. Let me give you just one example, Dr. Shiv Shankar, that we mentioned in the Human Rights Committee submissions. Dr. Shiv Shankar, uh, I mention this name because uh, the, the, uh, this particular uh, set of incidents, uh, the, the case is well known, um, at least in Sri Lanka. Dr. Shiv Shankar was arrested under the Prevention of Terrorism Act uh, for, uh, for uh, investigating or trying to investigate. He's a civil society <coughs> activist for trying to investigate uh, coercive recruitment of Tamil females into the Sri Lankan army in the Vanni. And he was arrested and kept in detention for six months. Now, the chain of events that led to his arrest was not actually this particular investigation that he was on with regard to recruitment of uh, female, uh, Tamil females into the Sri Lankan army, but on an article that he wrote to the Udayan where he said, four years, and he, uh, by the way, had, had no, no particular allegiance to 
the LTT. In fact, Dr. Shiv Shankar, been a been an important uh, member of the EPRL, was killed during the ceasefire period, allegedly by the LTT, when no papers were willing to publish that news item in in in, in Jaffna. Took it upon himself to actually publish an advertisement uh, condoning the death. Uh, of that particular activist. I'm, I'm uh, giving this instant because this person then writes an article very recently in 2012, uh, just before he's arrested, uh, that the possibility of, of, of the reconciliation terminology, the reconciliation framework being used to address issues in Sri Lanka, he, has, he said, has failed. And that uh, the question of whether these two uh, people and two nations can live together has to be seriously explored, is what he wrote. In the and this became the subject matter of high controversy, being a government servant, he was called by the governor uh, for investigations, and that set in motion uh, sort of uh, the, the incidents that led to him being uh, charged under the PTA. Um, he, was, he was never properly charged and then released after six months, and he has been asked not to challenge, not to uh, resort to any judicial activity or to go to the international sort of different foras to, to express what has happened to him uh, in those six months. Uh, I mentioned um, the the other the other point uh, of, of interest uh, may be also the fact that there are other means by which uh, today uh, uh, the the particularly Tamil press is being sidelined. Now you take for example what Udayan Valamburi and Tinakrol, uh, Udayan and Valamburi in particular. I'm sorry, Udayan and Valamburi are going through in the Jaffna District Court. There have been two cases uh, filed against each of these media organisations by the Jaffna Army Commander and uh, Mr. Douglas Sevananda, whom I won't describe because it should be obvious to you as to who this man is, uh, uh, for, for enormous amounts, I, I think compensation in, in lieu of uh, more than 1,000 million rupees, asking for compensation for articles that Udayan uh, and I think Balambri wrote based on WikiLeaks articles linking disappearances that happened uh, in, in, in Jaffna during the ceasefire period and, and beyond uh, to, uh, to uh, Mr. Devananda's political party. Now, I, I know very well that the Udayan actually found it very difficult to find even lawyers in Jaffna who were willing to uh, register themselves as on-the-record attorneys to conduct the case, that they had to bring in uh, people after a long delay. I, I think they spent about six to seven months trying to find lawyers who could, who could, uh, who could go on record as attorneys in that case. That shows you the kind of uh, tools that are uh, out there. It doesn't have to be, they don't have to resort to what they did to the Sanayakam of filing an indictment uh, under the PTA, they can resort to, they have come up with various legal avenues uh, to actually suppress the media. So that was, uh, that was the point that I want to stress, that for any serious uh, space for media freedom to merge, particularly from a Tamil media point of view, I think the Sixth Amendment and the PTA have to be taken out of the books. Without those, uh, 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 even a discussion of what the Tamil, even uh, an exercise of reminding the Tamil people that they are being oppressed, would become difficult, is difficult for the Tamil media. I can give you examples if there are, uh, of, of how Tamil media journalists have to engage in self-censorship in reporting some of the things uh, that can happen if, during question and answer if, if uh, people uh, 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 want more details in this regard. Let me move uh, very quickly to uh, the second issue, which is the whole uh, narrative of detamilization. Now, what do I mean by detamilization? Now, you see, one of the difficulties that the, the, the Tamil activists, the Tamil Civil Society Forum in particular has had, uh, but I think uh, which is uh, generally applicable to, to, to the Tamil case in the post-war context, is that there is a reading of what is happening in Sri Lanka in the post-war situation as merely being about issues relating to the current regime, as merely being about issues relating to rule of law, as merely being issues about relating to good governance in the country. And that this that, that the problem in Sri Lanka that has led to the kind of democratic uh, situation that you find in Sri Lanka, there has been a dealing to the Tamil national question. This is not just uh, this is not just the Sri Lankan government. I mean, Sri, the Sri Lankan government sometimes does remind us, as I have quoted from Ravina Tarya Singh, uh, the link uh, between the democratic repression that they are involved in and the Tamil national question. But to me, unfortunately, uh, international uh, civil society local civil society have also engaged in this kind of detamilization uh, uh, activity where to focus on uh, the, the Tamil national question is seen as diverting away from the issues relating to the regime. And hence people want to make the case. And this is true 
and, and, and I thought that there is a lot of sympathy for uh, and empathy with the work that uh, Madame Navanidham Pilla has carried out among the Tamils. Uh, it's particularly probably a difficult thing to say, but even in uh, Navanidham Pilla's report on Sri Lanka, the number of reports that she's done on Sri Lanka, there has been this, uh, this, this attempt at trying to de-Tamilize and to not uh, point to the Tamil specificity of the, some of the problems, but to point uh, the problems in Sri Lanka <coughs> as something that all ethnicities face on an equal level for the same reason. I don't agree. Now, I, this is not to say, and I've, I've had to sort of go on this defensive and, and, and say that, yes, there are problems for the Sinhalese and the Muslims in post-war Sri Lanka. No one is denying, uh, and no one is denying the, the, the ferocity of those problems and the importance of them being addressed. But what uh, I think the Tamil activists are trying to, trying it uh, very difficult to, to get across is the fact that the Tamil specificity of the problem is not recognized. Now, TAG, uh, Tamils Against Genocide, uh, in a report that they published, I think, uh, last year or a couple of years back, came out, for example, with an analysis of the number of people who have been killed, uh, media uh, personnel who have been killed in the, um, in between 2004 and 2009, and found that out of 44 cases, 37 cases uh, were actually uh, Tamil media personnel who had who been killed, either, uh, uh, either targeted killing or in action, or, uh, or whose um, uh, whereabouts are unknown, uh, disappeared uh, journalists, and pointed to the fact that even with regard to press freedom, that there is a link that needs to be made, that there is an ethnic, there is an under, uh, un, 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 uh, there is an ethnic logic to the, to, to the way in which the press freedom reports, and something that you can't say uh, that Sri Lanka faces press freedom issues equally and without analyzing the context within which particularly Tamil journalists suffer from and the disproportionate uh, number of Tamil uh, journalists who are affected from this problem. So I think it is, it, is, uh, it is very important that we look at this. Let me, I mean, the Sri Lankan government is a, is a particular reminder. Just recently, as, as many of you know, uh, as people, uh, keen observers of Sri Lanka would know, uh, there were seven journalists who were uh, stopped at Oman there in July, I believe, in July or August, I believe, from attending a conference organized uh, by Transparency International, um, in funded by the U.S. Embassy in Colombo. Now, in their press release, the Sri Lankan government says that the U.S. Embassy has to be sensitive towards organizing activities that are specific to a particular community, right? And they say that you can't organize uh, sort of events that target only uh, the the um, only the Tamil community. Again, they are they are they are worried about the Tamil specificity there, right, of, of let's say, whereas if you look at the U.S. Uh, Embassy's press release on the, uh, on the issue, they don't even say that it was Tamil journalists who were, they, it was general description of saying that journalists were uh, arrested and reprimanded. So on both sides, both the Sri Lankan government to an extent, and even international actors want to deny uh, the fact that there is a specific problem relating to Tamils uh, that needs to be addressed, and I think this is also true. Uh, with regard to um, with regard to uh, the question of press freedom, something uh, is a general problem, but also true of uh, when we talk about press freedom. Finally, on um, I want to make a few comments, and uh, this is, in a sense, a, uh, an introspective uh, view in terms of uh, what has happened to Tamil journalism in the post-war context. Now, one of the the, the politics that Tamil people are being subjected to, both from the Sri Lankan government and international actors, uh, well-meaning international actors is that to talk of Tamil self-determination, to talk about the Tamil specificity of a problem, to articulate, for example, we've had queries as to why we have to call ourselves a Tamil <coughs> Civil Society Forum, for example, as to whether that specificity and attachment to a particular ethnic community is, is, is the right frame in which uh, to engage things. We've been asked questions about this. So there has been largely a delegitimization of Tamil self-determination <coughs> politics that has been imposed on by the Tamil people, and I think uh, we see that being reflected in Tamil politics, in our political mainstream through our representative uh, party politics, who have now, uh, I think, whittled down Tamil self-determination politics to minority politics, who have also signed up to the fact that it's not Tamil self-determination politics, it's not the Tamil national question which should be at the heart of the, heart of the discourse, but really an issue relating to rule of law and good governance that have to be. And it is in this context that uh, what this says is absolutely right. And this is how the 13th Amendment, for example, uh, which, which, which has been rejected uh, by, by the Tamil people, not only by the Tamil people, but there is a consensus among, for example, the constitutional 
uh, royally class of Sri Lanka of the of the useless uh, character, useless uh, content of the Thirteenth Amendment. But suddenly to reject the Thirteenth Amendment, to vociferously say that the Thirteenth Amendment is no good, that we will not accept it even as a starting point to a solution, which had been the position of all these groups before, becomes an extremist <coughs> position. Today to articulate what this is said or to articulate what I am saying as the 13th Amendment doesn't even constitute a starting point is considered to be an extremist position. And hence even the Tamil National Alliance has to now resort to a position where they say we are willing uh, to, call, to push to call for full implementation of the 13th Amendment and, uh, which I don't understand what means and, and to say that the 13th Amendment uh, uh, provides a basis for building upon a political solution again which I don't understand constitutionally speaking. So, and, and to this, the Tamil media is also subjected. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of self-regulation where you're trying to self-regulate yourself because the modes and the frames of extremism and what is moderate is being dictated to you and you're being asked to follow suit. This, I believe, is something that Tamil journalists, both, uh, are, both back in the homeland and the diaspora, have to be very careful about. Um, I think what is needed is for the Tamil side to be to be confident about the legitimacy of their demands, to be to be confident about the legitimacy of, of what their political stance is and what their political articulation is, and to say it uh, in, in 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 so many words so that so that it it communicates the Tamil position rightly. Now this is not to say that we have to engage in a monologue that we say what we want. We don't care about the listener. We don't care about the person who involves it. But it needs to come from the position of what kind of position, what kind of positions have we taken in the past? Is that right? And do we need to continue those positions? And those positions are right to continue to engage in a dialogue with external actors from that position. It can't be, uh, it can't be a situation where the Tamils are told through a monologue, be it India, be it the United States, be it anybody, where we are told in a monologue that this is the position that you have to adopt. Uh, this does not mean, and I stress, uh, saying to India and the US that we won't engage with you. It is about stating the Tamil position clearly and then engaging it, engaging from there. And in this, I see that the Tamil media has, has lost its, uh, its prior sort of uh, uh, principal stance on the Tamil issue that has been reflected for so long. Today, it is very difficult to get space, and I, I, I say this with a lot of regret, in the Tamil media back home on some of these positions with regard to the 13th Amendment. It is very difficult, for example, to find space within the Tamil media about critically engaging, not, not in a destructive way, in a constructive way, with how the Tamil political leadership moves on with these issues. So I think, I think it, is, it is time for Tamil media to, 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 to also look at in terms of what their contribution is. Uh, Sivaram is quoted by Mark Vaitek as saying that uh, Tamil journal, uh, journals in general uh, are, are not just, uh, should not be in the habit of covering history, but also uh, should work for in the sense of, of, of making history as being part of the uh, way in which uh, discourses uh, take place and are, and are moved ahead. And I think that sort of a that sort of a conscious has to be brought back to the Tamil media, where we engage in positions where we don't go for a unilateral, exclusive uh, positions. That is not what I'm advocating. But we look at issues from what is best in the best interests of uh, of the Tamil people and advocate these positions. So I think uh, a lot of people, and I have also in the past termed what the Tamil people in are in as a transitionary place, where there is a lot also that we need to do internally to build capacity, to rethink our positions, uh, to be confident about what our politics is, to be able to move ahead, given the disaster that 2009 and, and Tamil media is also a very significant part of it. So my appeal to organizations like the International Association of Tamil Journalists is to engage with your, with your friends uh, back home. To, to, to possibly help build, uh, help build capacity. I think we need to, I mean, uh, just just uh, a couple of weeks back, we saw Al Jazeera uh, a documentary where the Udayan editor is seen saying that uh, there, are, there, are, uh, uh, there is nobody senior to him and he's 40 and that most of his um, journalists are just uh, teenagers out of home. There is a question of how much we pay our journalists, how can we help uh, our, our, our sort of media establishment stand on their own, is there a way in which journalists can start owning their own media establishment? I think this is a key question. One of the reasons why Tamil media houses have been mellowing down on the Tamil question, I think, relates to the question of ownership. Can there be a process whereby there is diaspora, homeland media interaction 
to make sure that journalists themselves uh, are able to own the media. So I know this is a global problem, but uh, in some way, re-looking at the question of who owns our media establishment and how that impacts uh, our articulation. Uh, so, so with that, uh, uh, and having already violated my time uh, limits, uh, I, I, I thank you again for this opportunity and look forward to further engagement during the question.